Well, good morning to each and every one of you, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Welcome to all of those who are listening in online with us. Welcome to all of our regular attenders, our members, all of our guests. Welcome to each and every one of you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your love. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, him crucified and resurrected. And Father, in Jesus, we thank you so very much for your Holy Spirit, who dwells in each and every person who believes who is with us as the church. And Father, we pray that you would give to us of your Holy Spirit this morning to convict us, to comfort us, to rebuke us, to build us up, to strengthen us, and to equip us. Father, we pray that this word might honor you this morning. And we pray that you would use your word from your scripture in all of our lives. In your name do we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Have we responded when the Lord called? Since the Lord has called us, are we certain we have our wedding garments on? What are our wedding garments our parable today is a very pointed parable. It develops the call of the Lord and the judgment upon those who respond wrongly to the Lord's call. Today, I want you to gain insight into the Lord's call and very seriously consider the outcome of our responses and way of life. So let's dive into the text here today that we have before us, Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, we're actually already in Jerusalem. Jesus has already triumphantly entered in, and he's already beginning a series of dialogues and almost combat with the Pharisees and the chief priests. The parable we're studying today in Matthew chapter 22 is the third parable with the theme that is running against the Pharisees and the chief priests. The first such parable is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. And it basically is saying the same point. Those who should have been worthy and should have known didn't and were not worthy, but those who were unworthy entered in. And he says this in Matthew 21, verse 31. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. What we thought is reversed. And the same happens again in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. That is again against the Pharisees and the chief priests. Here in Matthew chapter 22, it's the third such parable with that same sort of theme. Those who should have been worthy were not, and those who were unworthy enter in by the grace and mercy of God. And so we come to Matthew chapter 22, verse 1, and we simply say, And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. Here in this parable, then, we are comparing, we're seeing that God is like this king in the text. He rules like this king. This is how things will be done in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus continues, this king is giving a wedding feast for his son. And in verse 3, we see this, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. 
Now, we probably have read this parable a whole lot and simply flowed through these lines. We're like, well, yeah, they don't come. All right. We may even compare that to sometimes that we've turned down certain engagements, and we're like, ah, this is not a really a big deal. And that's because we're Americans, and Americans don't generally have royalty. But when a king invites someone to the wedding feast of their son, that's a, we automatically clear everything off our schedules to go. We don't decide that, oh, you know, I really need to hit the dentist appointment that day. The cavity waits. It's not a matter of, oh, well, I have so-and-so's other engagement to do. No, everything gets put on pause for the king. Clear the schedule. We've got to go. Today's the day. We're on our way. Oh, there's too much Dr. Seuss there. I'm sorry. It's, if anyone, I apologize. But we're on our way. This is, we've got to get to this royal banquet. We've got to get to the king's wedding feast. So the fact that the servants would not come in the first century AD, everyone's mouth does this. Well, it's, it's a matter of complete shock. It's a matter of the mouth drops open. What in the world are these people thinking? This is awful. This is terrible. This is an abomination. Which then makes the second invitation all the more serious and actually reflecting the shock of the king. The king sends other servants and says, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the feast. The second invitation is given in more detail. It shows the richness of the feast, the high quality of the feast, and the lengths to which the king has gone to prepare that feast. It's a matter of persuasion. It's a matter of saying, hey, look, this is going to be one of the best things you ever attend in your life. Come. To the wedding feast. Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. Now, here in this context, it is literally just a matter of that. This is a different parable from Luke 14. Um, there's, there's tremendous differences there. And here, it's just they go off to their regular day jobs. Um, King, what do you know? We're not going. That's one group. It's filled with selfish interests. It's filled with concerns about today and no concern to the one whom they've sworn allegiance to, which is the king. But then look in verse 6 because it gets worse while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The second part of that response is filled with abuse. It's filled with murder and total disregard of the king. Now, within this context, the servants are generally considered to be the Old Testament prophets and the apostles. It's those who are delivering the message of God. And all throughout history, these Old Testament prophets and apostles have been rejected again and again and again. And here's then what might surprise us or make this a little bit difficult for us, that the judgment of God is swift certain and sure. Look here in verse 7. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. For those who are in this category of already being invited, the ones who should have been worthy to go, the ones who instead reject the king's invitation, their judgment is sure and their destruction 
is certain. The king is angry. And he judges them for what they are. What were they? Murderers. But then that's not it. Look here in verse 8. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. But somebody's got to come. The feast is going to be had. My son will be celebrated. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. From those who are high class to just anyone and everyone, open the gates. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Did you notice that? It's both bad and good. In context, this is probably something like the riffraff, as well as, as those of decent quality, good and bad, bad and good. Now, we know that no one who comes to Christ will remain bad. No one who comes to Christ remains evil. And yet, in the initial invitation, all are collected, all come in. And there is sometimes where we would want the parable to end, on this joyous note of good and bad entering in. And yet Jesus goes on with these four additional verses, pointing out with clarity again for us what is needed. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. This is really sort of absurd again. Somebody attends a wedding, and yet they don't have a wedding garment. According to the commentators, and this is from R.T. France in his commentary, the wedding garment was simply a decent white, clean clothes, such as anyone would have on hand. One more time, it's simply decent, white, clean clothes. It's something that everyone would have on hand. It's more or less just... Wear your best that's available. And instead, this man came as he was. Whether he was a fisherman, whether he was traveling, whether he was do working as a, a smithy or whatever he was doing, he just came in his work clothes. And he's like, here I am at the wedding garment. Here I am at the wedding feast, covered in dust, covered in fish, whatever the case is. And the king asks him and says to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He knows he's in the wrong. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast them into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now we need to discuss this metaphor of the wedding garment. We need to find out what it is. What, what, is, what does God mean here? And then what is the outer darkness and on from there? Here's the thing. The garment metaphor is ultimately salvation in Jesus Christ. It's having received the righteousness of Christ by which he gives to us, or which he gives to us. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verses 24 through 25. In Romans chapter 4, Paul is discussing the matter of Abraham's righteousness. And what he says is that Abraham's righteousness is counted to him because of Abraham's faith. Not because Abraham was this amazingly good or perfect person. It was by faith, it was by belief that it was counted to him as righteousness. 
And in Romans chapter 4, verses 23 and on, it says this, But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ and receive his work, we are justified. When we are justified, we are given Christ's righteous garments as our own. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. A prophecy from Isaiah is just ringing itself true in Jesus Christ. God clothes us with garments of salvation. He covers us with the robe of righteousness. Only Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith, saves. And that's the wedding garment that we have. It's Jesus Christ and his work. It's Jesus Christ and his salvation. And the normal and proper response then, once we have and once we are saved, is to do good works that please God, do good works that flow from faith. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. That wedding image is used all through the New Testament about Jesus and the people of God. The wedding garment is Jesus Christ and his works. It's salvation. And as a natural result of salvation, it is expected that we do and obey God's good will. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 23. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness." There again, you're seeing again that clothing metaphor being used. But what is it this time? It's about being born again. And it's not just about being born again. It's about putting on the new life of holiness that we are called to live. You'll find that same sort of metaphor again being used in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. And so when we come back to our text, when we come back to this image of the wedding feast and this image of the wedding garment, we understand that the wedding garment is the salvation that Christ purchased for us. We also understand that when we are saved, when we are born again, we will live holy lives in response to the salvation that we have received. And we have to understand that it is not our good works that save us. It's only Jesus that saves. Yet when we are saved, good works 
flow. And the king then throws out the one who does not have a wedding garment. Only Jesus Christ, by grace through faith, saves. Now notice what happens here with this wedding garment person. Notice here in verse 13, he says, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. Outer darkness is very often an image for hell. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we've kind of gone over that. The weeping and gnashing can be a sort of sorrow over their sin. A sort of realization of what they've done finally at the last that they've missed it. But weeping and gnashing of teeth can also occur because of anger. And I think a very, a very um, reasonable way of interpreting this is to say that the individuals who are thrown out are so angry that they're weeping and gnashing teeth because they don't think they should be there. Haven't I been a good person? Wasn't I invited in? Didn't I continually go to church? Didn't I continually give to the food pantry? Didn't I continually do this or that good work? And what we find is good works will not save. Only Christ saves. Good works are a fruit that follow. Never misunderstand that order. We can't. There's too much at stake and too much at risk. And notice here then in verse 14 we see, For many are called, but few are chosen. There is a very fascinating interplay in Scripture between God's absolute sovereignty and human free will. And we have to go with both. At the same time, this text, while holding on to both God's sovereignty and free will, clearly says that there are some who are chosen. That the gospel goes out to all and calls all to respond, and yet some are not chosen to respond. Fascinating interplay. That's not the subject for today's sermon. We can do a Bible study on that subject sometime. But we have to hold on to both God's sovereignty and free will. God's choosing. They are chosen. And people responding. Now practically, we might want to know here today, what are some signs that I'm not dressed in the wedding garments required? What are some signs that I am dressed? These points are crucial for self-examination, but can only be summarized with our remaining time. First, some signs that I am not dressed in the wedding garments of Christ are the following. Number one, I insist that my good works get me into heaven, or that by believing in Jesus, he simply sprinkles his blood upon my good works, so that I can get into heaven through them. That is a sign we are not dressed in the wedding garments of God, the wedding garments of salvation. It's filled with pride about our own innate goodness, that all we really need to do is be slightly polished up, not entirely made new. Another sign that we are not wearing the wedding garments of Christ is if we have not the sign of the Holy Spirit working in us to convict us of sin and to empower and sanctify us to Christ-likeness. What's this like? This is like striving for holiness on one's own. This is like never seeing that our own sin is actually sin. We kind of just come to this place where it's like, well, actually my sin is really okay, and, and you're okay, and I'm okay, and we're all just human anyway. 
This is like striving for holiness and continually failing because the Holy Spirit is not working in us. That's not to suggest we would be perfect, but we should see signs of progress our whole lives long. Number three, if we do not walk in the obedience of faith, if we do not do the things that Christ commands us and calls us to do, then we do not have the wedding garments of Christ on. To slightly dismiss the word of God and say, I'm going to live my life the way I want to, would show that we are not among those who are saved. Hans Denk, an early Anabaptist writing in 1527, writes this, The obedience must be genuine. That is, that heart, mouth, and deed coincide together. One sign that we are born again is that the new creature, the new heart, working under the power of the Holy Spirit, is driven to align the person to act for Christ in every situation. Against this, if we hold on to a secret love for sin, then we have great question or great cause to question if we wear the wedding garments of Christ or not. Sinners, hear the gospel. Christ died for you. Come unto him, weeping and broken over sin, and seek the Lord for his mercy to shine upon you. So what are some signs that we are dressed in the garments of Christ's righteousness? First, if we have truly felt the depths of our sin and sorrow over them, if we believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, knowing that we are utterly lost and damned to hell without the precious blood of Jesus Christ and his mercy upon us, and if we have met with and experienced God's great work in our hearts, minds, and mouths that lead us to confess and truly and completely Jesus is Lord by faith, then we have great cause for rejoicing that we are dressed in the wedding garments of Christ. We have been under conviction. We know Jesus is our salvation. We come by faith. Second, if we experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit about sin, if we are driven to loving God and loving others, if we find life, in God's word, if we find sin losing sway and being vanquished in our lives, whether quickly or slowly, then we have good indications that the Holy Spirit has been set as a seal upon us for salvation. That conviction may come over time. There may be some things we did at the beginning of our Christian journeys that later on we repent of and no longer do. Third, if we find we walk in ever closer and holy, holier obedience to the Lord, then we have good reason for believing we are dressed in the wedding garments of the King. Saints, Walk closely with the Lord. If you are young in faith, feast richly upon his word and trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. Walk in obedience as you find it in scripture. For those who are more mature, do the same. Feast richly upon the word of God, but also be closely attentive to your walk with him. Be tender in your minds and hearts towards him. Rejoice and praise him with loud thanksgiving always. And make certain that in your maturity, you do not grow prideful so that you stop leaning on Jesus. Never stop leaning on him. He is the one who makes you worthy. Let us run the race leaning on Jesus, our Lord and Savior, all the day long. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We rejoice in you. 
We thank you so much for the salvation that you have given in Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray that you would build us up and comfort us, strengthen us and empower us to walk in your way. May your word always be the light unto our feet, the lamp unto our path. May you be our good shepherd, guiding us all the days of our lives. Holy Spirit, come. In your name do we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.